All right, guys. Uh, chapter one, we're starting with 1.2. I'm pretty sure that you can look at the 1.1 PowerPoint and kind of get that for yourself. It's just straight stuff off the PowerPoint. Um, dealing with 1.2, first thing we need to do is look at some terms. Uh, first, we're going to look at matter, atom, element, compound, and molecule. Now, matter is anything that has mass in a volume or anything that has mass and takes up space. We've probably known this definition um, for a while now, back definitely in ninth grade and probably eighth grade and seventh grade as well. So we kind of heard that before. Now, an atom, uh, an atom is the smallest unit of an element that keeps the properties of that element. Okay, an atom, and what we can write down with this, an atom is made up of, made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and um, it's the smallest form of an element. Now, an element is just a pure substance made up of only one type of atom. So an element is made up of atoms, and specifically only one type of atom. Now, a compound, a compound is made when two or more types of atoms uh, are bonded together. And the main thing here is that those compounds, that they are chemically bonded together. Okay, they make something brand new, and a compound is brand new, separate from uh, the elements that make it up. Now, a molecule is a specific type of compound. Uh, a molecule is a type of compound in which the bonds are covalently bonded. It's a very specific type of compound. Okay, it has a very specific type of bond. And we'll talk about covalent bonds uh, a little bit later. Now, the properties of matter, um, chemists, we use these characteristic properties. Um, to tell us about the different types of elements and substances that we're dealing with. And these particular uh, characteristics help us to put these properties or put these um, substances into groups. Now the types of properties that we have, we have extensive and intensive properties. Okay, our extensive, it depends on the amount of matter, okay, our volume or our mass. Okay, our intensive don't depend on the amount just on what it is, okay? Meaning density, the density of water will always be the same no matter if we have a million liters or just one milliliter. The density never changes. The same thing with the boiling point of water. Water will always boil at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level. Now, the two types of properties that we're really gonna focus on today are physical and chemical properties. Now, a physical property uh, it says that the characteristics that can be observed or measured without changing the identity of the substance. The main thing with physical, anytime you think, see physical, physical change, physical property, anything with physical, it never, physical never changes the identity. The identity is always the same. When we're looking at a physical characteristic, we measure the temperature of water, uh, we don't change what water actually is, we just measure the temperature. Now chemical, Chemical properties, on the other hand, uh, relates to the substance's, substance's ability to undergo change that transforms it into a different substance. Main thing with chemical, we're looking at chemical change, chemical properties, we're looking at something different. Okay, We're looking at something it transforms into, how it reacts with something. And after we observe that chemical change or the chemical property, we have something brand new. We have something different than what we started with. And again, we're talking about physical changes here. Um, that's just a change in the substance that does not change the identity of the substance. Just reiterating what we said before. Now, the main physical changes that we're probably used to are changes between solid, liquid, and gas. Um, obviously, uh, we see that pretty regularly with, with water, going from a solid state in ice to a liquid state as liquid water and then we see it in a gaseous state when we boil water. So that should be very common to us, those physical changes. Now specifically looking at a solid, a solid has a definite volume and a definite shape and those atoms are packed very closely together uh, in a fixed position. And in most solids, the solid state, the atoms are the closest as they can possibly get. Um, and as we move up through liquid and into gas, they tar start to spread out. Well, since those atoms are so tightly packed together, um, 
we see that those atoms have very high attractive forces between each other. So the atoms that they are close to, they like each other. And that means they want to hold on to each other and not let go. Now a liquid, we see that it has a definite volume, indefinite shape, and atoms are still really close together, but what has happened is they have overcome so, some of those attractive forces, which allows them to move. And when we talk about move, we're talking about atoms. Atoms are just moving around, which that's what gives the liquid the ability to take any shape of the container that it's in. And lastly, we have the gases. Gases have indefinite volume and indefinite shape. Atoms are moving very quickly. They're very far apart uh, when we think of atomic level. And the attractive forces between them, they, they don't have any, basically. And they're just moving around as fast as possible. And they are bumping into each other. And they just don't like each other. They don't want to hold on to each other. Now, the changes in the state of matter, we see that we have going from a solid to a liquid. We call that melting. And we go from a liquid to a gas. We call that vaporization. Going from a gas back into a liquid, we see that it's condensation. And going from a liquid to a solid, we call that freezing. Okay. Now, one thing we might not be used to is sublimation. Sublimation is when we go from a solid to a gas without going through the liquid state. Prime example of this is dry ice. It's a solid carbon dioxide. And as that carbon dioxide heats up, it changes straight from a solid straight into a gas. Now, chemical changes in the matter, it's a change in which a substance is converted into a different substance. Remember, we said that chemical, anytime we see chemical, chemical means something brand new. Okay, chemical change is also the same as a chemical reaction. Okay, now it doesn't change the amount of matter present. This is relating back to the conservation of mass. Okay, it doesn't change how much we have. Uh, we're changing just what it is. Now, reactants are the substances that react. Um, a better definition for this is probably just what we can understand a little better. That's the substance that we start with. Our reactants is what we start with. Our products is what we're finishing with. It's the substance that are produced. So as those reactions come together, they produce the product. So here we have mercury and iodine. And mercury and iodine would be our reactants, and we see that mercuric iodide would be our products. Now, when any change occurs, energy is always involved. Okay, energy can be in different forms, meaning light or heat, um, but energy is never destroyed or created. This is the law of conservation of energy, and usually they're put together, uh, mass and energy. It's usually the law of conservation of mass and energy, meaning energy and mass can neither be created nor destroyed. Okay, so whatever energy that is produced, that's the energy um, that has already been there. It's been stored in the bonds. Now, two types of uh, reactions that we see. We've already seen these in the lab. We have exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions. Now, exothermic reaction, it gives off energy. Okay, it feels warm outside. When we put the calcium chloride into the water in our test tube, uh, we felt that test tube and we felt that test tube heat up. Okay, that's an exothermic reaction. Now the endothermic reaction, uh, when we put the citric acid and sodium bicarbonate in the test tube and mix those two together, we see that it felt cold. The test tube got colder. That would be an example of an endothermic reaction.